Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mark Rothstein, a trustee of the Washington Institute from Los Angeles, California. I've been looking forward to this evening all weekend. In a Middle East filled with crisis and challenge, no story is more gripping, more agonizing, more complex, and at the same time more straightforward than the story playing out in Syria. At one level, we're watching a terrible human tragedy unfold before our eyes. At another level, we're watching a replay of one of the oldest stories we know, the story of man's insatiable thirst for freedom. At still another level, we're watching the chess game of Middle East maneuvering, a proxy battle between Iran and its allies and America and its allies, as well as one of the last episodes of the Cold War revisited in the Middle East. And at still one more level, we're watching a slow motion debate unfold in this country about what to do about heinous atrocities and mass killings that come at an inconvenient time in a complicated place. All this and more is the story of Syria today. What to do about Syria? That is the question of tonight's discussion. And we could not have a more knowledgeable and distinguished panel than the one that shares the stage with me tonight. Let me offer some very brief introductions. Fuad Ajami is a world-renowned historian who has served as the most thoughtful and insightful interpreter of the modern Middle East for a generation of Americans. After 30 years here at Washington at John Hopkins SAIS, he moved out to the West Coast last year where he is currently a senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution and co-chair of the Herbert and Jane Dwight Working Group on Islamism and the International Order. His newest book, which will be published next month, is appropriately enough titled, The Syrian Rebellion. Our second speaker is Ambassador Ted Katouf. Ambassador Katouf is president of AMED East, the largest US educational and training organization operating in the Middle East. But most importantly for this panel, he served as the last United States ambassador to spend a full tour of duty in Damascus, the capital of Syria. That was the final posting of a distinguished 30-year diplomatic career that included stops in all corners of the Middle East. We're very grateful Ambassador Katouf could join us tonight. And if we have one scholar and one diplomat, it is only appropriate that we complete the panel with an outstanding journalist. And that's what we have in Mr. Peter David. In his 30 years with The Economist, Peter has worked as foreign editor, business editor, British political editor, and Middle East specialist. Nearly two years ago, he assumed his current position as Washington bureau chief and author of the must-read Lexington column. Let's welcome him. <laughs> to guide our discussion, I'm pleased to turn the mic over to our director, Mr. Rob Satloff. Well, friends, as you can see, we have, we have a remarkable panel of expertise up on the stage right now. So I'm going to turn it over directly to my friend and colleague, Fuad Ajami. Fuad. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much, Rob. It's an honor to be here. I think this is a very difficult audience to speak to. And I think there is a, there's a character, I think he's a, he was a great folk character in the Arab world, and he was famous for stunts and verbal quips. And those who are Arabs or know about the Arab world know about him. And his name was Juha. And the strategy, I think, today, an ideal strategy for me would have been Juha's strategy in giving this talk. Juha once called for a meeting, and then he stood up and said, do you folks know what I'm going to talk to you about? And they said, no. And he said, well, then there is no use talking to you because it's just not going to work. <laughs> so then he came the second time, 
And he asked him the same question. Do you know what I'm going to talk to you about? He said, well, yes. He said, well, you already know, so again, there's no need to tell you. So they set a trap for him the next time. He came and asked the same question. Do you know what I'm going to talk to you about? And half said yes, and half said no. He said, well, then those who know could tell those who don't know, <laughs> and left. And I think this would have been a great, this is a great strategy here. This is a very, very awesome audience, and it's hard to impress an audience like this. It's an honor, really, for me to be here. Winnip is an amazing institution, and I think Rob Satloff is one of the most incredible leaders in an academic institution. <laughs> a man of real expertise, but also, above all, of grace, and a man of real honor, and I think he's made the Washington Institute, the Washington Institute a home for almost everyone. Now, I know about the Washington Institute because I've relied on the Washington Institute when I was a classroom teacher. I recruited David Makovsky, and that was a good strategy. Because, you know, we made a good team, right? I mean, it was a nice team. You get the, you get the drift, Arab and Jew, young and old, right? Orthodox and heretic, you know? <laughs> and at the time, we both were bearded, he had, you know, black beard, I had gray beard. So it was a very good, it was a very good formula. And it's also great because I didn't have to worry about it. I just say, well, David, what do you think? And that was about all I needed to do. I also, <laughs> I also taught with Mahdi Khalaji, and I want to tell you something about Mahdi, and I mean this in the best sense. I think this Mahdi is doubtless, to my mind, perhaps the finest interpreter of Iran in the United States. And it's just... I just, I just really don't think you, people realize just the, the depth of his knowledge of Iran is just stunning. Now, for myself tonight, I want to say something to you. I am not a Syria expert. I just play one on TV. <laughs> I just, I'm not a Syria expert. There are many, many people here who know Syria much more than I do. But the last year was consumed for me by Syria because I was driven by a sense of moral outrage by that regime. I became convinced that that regime has to be brought down because the only way you can have a humane order in the Middle East would be to bring down the Bashar al-Assad tyranny. So I began writing this book and I began traveling. I went to Turkey several times. And the members of the Syrian National Council who were in Turkey took to me and took me in and I had the, the best education that I could have gotten. Better yet, I ended up going to the Syrian refugee camps on the outskirts of Antakya. And in the refugee camps, I had a full education. I was lucky with my wife to meet a family from Jusr al-Shughur. And what these people taught me about Syria and about tyranny was stunning. They were property holders. As the man said, I'm Malak ibn Malak. I'm a property holder, the son of a property holder, the head of this family. They had a room, they had a house of eight rooms in Jusr al-Shughur. They had a fishery business on the, on the banks of the Orantis. They had nine children, and the mother in this household was amazing. She was a stunningly beautiful woman in her, in her middle 50s after nine children. Two of their children were killed, and the mother has their pictures on her cell phone. Their pictures alive and then their pictures dead. And one of their sons was missing. Missing in the lexicon of Syria is presumed dead. I don't think Bashar al-Assad is keeping many prisoners. I think they're liquidating everyone who falls into their gr grasp. So from this, I learned enormous amount about this particular tragedy of, of the Syrian people. Syria is with the Arab awakening meets its cruelest test. By the way, there's a term people use called the Arab Spring. I never use it anymore. I went and used it foolishly in the office of Secretary Schultz. And anyone who knows George Schultz, you don't say foolish things in front of George Schultz. He said, what do you mean, the Arab Spring? You're setting yourself up, spring, then a scorching summer comes, and then a terrible winter, and so on. He said, so I said, what, should I, what language should I use? He said, well, what about the Arab awakening? I said, the awakening it is. And it's amazing because he hadn't known of a book called The Arab Awakening, which was published in 
eight, you know, some, something like 1939 or so, and it chronicled the first Arab awakening, the awakening from the Ottoman century. So it is the awakening. And Syria is the place where this Arab awakening, if you will, met this cruel regime. Syria is the place where the Arab political pathologies, the state, as a war booty, ghanima is the Arabic word, as a war booty, and the possession of a ruling sect and a ruling family, and the arena where the merchant military nexus dominates economic life, all these things are at their sharpest in Syria. It was there 30 years ago, last February to be exact, in Hama, that there was born the politics of mass killing in the Arab world. Politics in the Arab world had known violence, but Hama was a different level of violence, 30,000, 40,000, the numbers really just are amazing. They are stunning. And this is where this mass pathology and these mass murders began. So for a student of Arab politics, an inquiry into Syria is inevitable. It's what you need to look at. Now, I, have, I bring you some, you know, just a few little things I can tell you you may not have known. First of all, I want you to know, I want to make it abundantly clear, ladies and gentlemen, that Syria is not Libya, just in case you think Syria is Libya. Libya. This is the, the mantra of the administration. Syria is not Libya. And I always say, I know, I know. Libya has oil. Syria produces olive oil. Libya is in Africa. Syria is in Asia. Libya had a deranged ruler who called his people rats and promised to hunt them down, as he said it in that memorable speech, bait, bait, house, house, hara, hara. A quarter by quarter, and then my favorite, Zanga Zanga. No one knew what the hell Zanga Zanga was. Uh, yeah, Zanga Zanga. So he promised to hunt them down this way. Syria has a methodical killer for a ruler who calls his people germs, right, and hunts them down on a daily basis without triggering foreign intervention. So this is the difference, if you will, between Syria and Libya. Syria's germs. There was a banner I like which said, Syria's germs salute Libya's rats. This was a banner that was held in one of the street demonstrations. Libya, as we now know, and we know in retrospect with pain in, 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 in the last 14 months or so, Libya was solar lunar eclipse. It was really a unique case. All the stars were aligned for the Libyan people to be liberated from that monster who, who ruled them for 42 years. The Arab League, which never stood up to a tyrant, outed Gaddafi, gave a warrant for a Western intervention against them. After all, that was easy, remember? He was king of the kings of Africa. He had turned his back on the Arabs, and the Arabs were just more than happy to just simply break with him. So that was one piece of luck for the Libyan people. Then there was BHL. I don't know if you know the initials. This is Bernard Henri Levy the French intellectual who took to the, the, the cause of the Libyans to his heart and sold it to Sarkozy, and Sarkozy and Cameron took the lead into Libya. President Obama, half in, intervened. He led from behind. He led from behind. But that was plenty. That was good enough. The rebellion in Libya, which was started in March, was done by October, and Gaddafi was pulled out of a drainage pipe. I made a lot of people angry when he was pulled out of a drainage pipe, I was on CNN and said, good riddance to him. And people thought, you know, you can't say that, you know, it's Gaddafi. Luckily, I was joined not so long after that by Charles Krauthammer, who issued, who echoed the same sentiment, so I was in good company. So this was what happened with the Libyan case. Now, we know that Russia and China had given a green light for an operation that NATO used to launch that campaign the campaign that decapitated the Gaddafi regime. The Russians and the Chinese maintain that NATO had overstretched its mandate and misread the United Nations Security Council resolution which authorized the intervention in Libya. I take issue with that. Remember, the resolution said it called for the protection of civilians. And how in the hell do you protect Libyan civilians without killing Muammar al-Qaddafi and decapitating his regime. So I think what was supposed to happen in Libya happened. A case of Libya envy grips the Syrians. 14 months into the rebellion, the cavalry has not arrived. 
Instead of NATO's Air Force, we sent to the Syrians Kofi Annan. Now, I was worried about the Syrians. And when Kofi Annan showed up, I became truly worried about the Syrians. My attitude was, look, I would have thought that after Rwanda and Bosnia and oil for food and the famous cigar he smoked with Saddam Hussein, I think it was time for a coffee break. But we got, <laughs> we, but we got, we got Kofi Annan. We got Kofi Annan instead. Now, again, as a student of this war, this rebellion in Syria, I became interested in the banners, the placards that young people carried. They were amazing, and they told an incredible story. Remember, this is the first YouTube war in history, this Syrian rebellion. So we were treated to it, and we can see what was going on. And there was one banner I liked which said, the butcher kills, the observers observe, and the people go on with the revolution. The people go on with the revolution. So much for Kofi Annan and the diplomacy. Another banner held in one town, Syrian town, was more stark. It said, UN observers bring death. And you know what? They bring death because if you talk to them, the shabiha, the vigilantes of the regime are watching you. And indeed, you get in trouble for having anything to do with the UN observers. I think this Kofi, this, this Kofi Annan diplomacy was what it was for me. It was a lifeline for the regime. It was a lifeline for the regime to go on killing. So this was so much for that diplomacy. Now, in the Syria deliberations, deliverance is always around the corner. It's always just another gathering of the friends of Syria away. You know, there is a group, the friends of Syria, all the democracies and the Arab states. And then there are the friends of the Syrian regime, Russia, China, to a lesser extent. The Chinese really don't give a damn. They're not invested in this the way Russia is invested in this. Iran, Hezbollah, and to his eternal shame, again, an ally of the, of the Bashar regime, turned out to be none other than Nur al-Maliki, the prime minister of Iraq, an order we midwife with American sacrifices. But Maliki, I've known him very well for a very long time. He had lived for 17 years in Syria, and he developed all kinds of ties to the Syrian regime. And I think he made his call that this would be it. Now, in these tortured discussions of Syria, we're always saying, like, look, again, in a variation on Syria is not Libya. We say we can't really do anything in Syria. Homs is not Benghazi. That's one remark I hear. The air defenses of Syria are thick when compared to those of Libya. That's, again, another one. The army of the Damascus regime is mighty. And then there is the mother of all alibis. The borders of Syria are more sensitive, and they preclude a rescue operation akin to the one that delivered the Libyans from their nightmare. But the truth of it is that the air defense system of Syria could be penetrated with ease, as Israel demonstrated, blessedly, in 2007. So that could be done. And that mighty Syrian army, when I was with the refugees, they told me that they have a label for the Syrian army, and I think our colleagues from Syria will testify to this. They call it Jaysh Abu Shahata, the army in slippers. It's a wretched army and could be pushed to its grave very easily. The defections are high, and I think you have your own expert who knows this better than I do. So I think there is a lot that could be done, and there is tremendous ease, if you will, if we really, if there was any American leadership, I think much could be done to deliver the Syrian people from their trouble. But we don't do it. We don't do it. The great story to me of the Syrian rebellion and this 14 months behind us is the abdication of the, of the Obama administration. The president has no interest in delivering the Syrians from their trouble. Some months ago, the Secretary of State amazed me. She, delib she gave a couple of interviews in Rabat in February. And instead of berating the Syrian regime, she berated the Syrian rebellion. She berated the Syrian opposition. And then we ended up waiting for the Russians to give us their approval. And you know what my, my, my comment on this is? Any model UN team in any high school in the United States could have told you there was going to be a Russian veto. And here's my take on the Russian, on the Russian veto and on the Russian objections. The most useful member, the most useful member of the Hillary Clinton team was none other than Foreign Minister, Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov. We used, the, we used the Russians as an excuse in order to stall. So we bought this time. 
We've worked nearly 14 months, and always, as I said, deliverance is around the corner. And I think that these, for example, take that excuse that the borders of Syria are sensitive, but that's exactly the reason why there should be a rescue operation for the Syrian people. This is the reason why we should do so. When you have a regime that has the, these borders, Israel, Jordan, Iraq, Turkey, Lebanon, this is the place, if you will, to show American leadership. A very good friend of mine, a very good colleague of mine, Charlie Hill from Hoover and the Yale, a great student of strategy, looked at Syria and said, this is the place to rattle the turbans. This is the place to take on the Iranians. The Iranians are waging a proxy war in Syria, and this is the place to break them. So I think we haven't done it. So obvious is the American abdication that many people in the region have begun to, in a way, are given to thinking that perhaps the Obama administration doesn't mind, does not mind to see the regime survive this rebellion. Now, whether it is so, I think we can take it up in, in, the, in the discussion. Now, we can't really rely on the United Nations. You know, I think if Secretary Clinton wants to somehow think creatively about the Syrian rebellion and the Syrian tragedy, I think she should spend some time talking to Bill Clinton. And when she talks to Bill Clinton, I don't know if they spend a lot of time together, <laughs> but if she talks to Bill Clinton, maybe Bill Clinton could lay out to her how he did Kosovo. I did a piece for the Wall Street Journal called Kosovo Model for Syria. We know how he did Kosovo. Even though he was close to Boris Yeltsin, we ignored the Russians. We didn't attribute to them powers they didn't have. And we did Kosovo without the loss of a single American soldier. And indeed, we know what happened in Kosovo. There was 30,000 sorties. There was 11-week bombing campaign that destroyed Milosevic and the power of Serbia. What did the Russians do? I'll tell you what they did. They sent 50 trucks and 200 soldiers. I wonder if they, I'm surprised they had gasoline for the trucks. They ended up occupying the Pristina airport. And the commander of NATO said, ask, should we, should we destroy them? They said, no, no, make them part of the NATO peacekeeping mission. So we made them part of the NATO peacekeeping mission. So I think this is where we are in, in the tragedy of Syria. Without American leadership, no one is going to do anything. And the trick of the Obama administration is to always say it's boots on the ground or head in the sand. That's my interpretation. It's either boots on the ground or head in the sand. Since Americans don't want boots on the ground, then we give the Syrian regime a pass. Finally, this is my favorite. The president at the Holocaust Memorial Museum the other day announced something that's, that was really stunning. He announced the creation. I think this is so Orwellian, you will cherish that. He announced the creation of an atrocities prevention board, right? You know, this is like, it should be like old bureaucracy, like old bureaucracies, it should, like old bureaucracies, it should be, somehow there should be a kind of acronyms for it. The APB, there should be an atrocities prevention board. And I presume that that means dictators check in there and, and ask whether they can commit atrocities that day or under these particular circumstances. I mean, it's, it's, it's completely, it's pathetic, it's lamentable. And everyone knows, I mean, you, you just, you, you sit in the, in the tents of these refugees and they'll tell you, uh, the American president doesn't want to help us. He won't help us before November. And they ask you desperately, will he help us after November? I leave this question for the panel and for the discussion. But thank you very much for your indulgence. Uh, thank you, Fouad. Fouad, I wish you had, you had actually dropped your restraint and told us what you really thought. Next time. Um, I do want to note two things. Um, first, neither, neither Ted nor, nor Peter represents the administration, uh, point one. And point two, uh, tomorrow, uh, the Deputy National Security Advisor, Dennis McDonough, will be here. So we can at least have, uh, it's very important for us to have that, uh, that, that, that vital 
um, perspective here at this podium on this topic. Second, we'll now turn to Ambassador Ted Katouf. Ted. Chair Rothstein, Rob, it's a pleasure to be all, with all of you this evening, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Ajami's presentation, and now mine, reminds me a little bit of the repartee between Ed McMahon and the late Johnny Carson. <laughs> you might recall that occasionally Johnny would don a turban and be Karnak the Magnificent. And Ed would give him the answer, and then Johnny would think and cogitate and come up with a clever question. So it seems the professor has given us all the answers tonight. Being the wishy-washy former diplomat, I have only questions and concerns. Uh, and I'm glad that uh, Rob mentioned that I don't speak for the administration, because I truly do not. Uh, I think most observers and analysts can agree on certain key judgments concerning what is going on in Syria. I don't think that Dr. Ajabi or Peter or myself or others would disagree too much on the facts or the analysis. The Assad regime is essentially a mafia regime. And by the way, I didn't come by that early. I, I served in Syria in 1976 to 1978 as a junior political officer. And uh, I read The Godfather back then by the great uh, Mario Puzo. Uh, and it was hard not to see the parallels even then between the regime and the, uh, and the uh, Corleone family. In fact, some people say that the Arabs were in Sicily for 200 years and taught the Sicilians everything they know. I don't, uh, I defer to Professor Ajami on that. Uh, <clears throat> the Assad regime will desperately cling to power regardless of the cost to the Syrian people and to the country. I mean, that's very evident. They have no intention whatsoever of parting with power or leaving the country. The same regime is not interested in serious negotiations or fundamental reforms of the current system, as it would force them to give up the power that I've just said they willingly will not give up. Uh, they have the loyalty of overlapping intelligence and security units. And the overwhelming majority of the army, or at least the professional army, remains loyal to the Assad regime. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody in the bowels of the Defense Intelligence Agency or CIA knows, but it is said that approximately 80% of the professional officer corps come from the same sect as the president and his family, the Alawis. And I'm convinced that a vast majority of the professional non-coms also come uh, from that sect. Most Syrians are sympathetic to one or another of the opposition factions. But there still remains a significant minority, as I've just pointed out, since the Alawis are 10 to 12 percent of Syria's population, uh, that is uh, staying with the devil they know. And that includes to some extent, although it's hard to generalize, but it includes to some extent the Christian minority, another 5 to 8 percent of the population, and the Druze and the Ismailis, another 3 or 4 percent. And even until now, there are some Sunni merch sort of merchant class who grudgingly uh, sit on the fence or, or remain sympathetic to the regime because that's where their income has been coming from all these years. Uh, there are people who've spoken today, uh, like Jeff White and others, who know the opposition far better than I. I have not been in a Syrian refugee camp in Turkey. But the opposition is badly fractured, no surprise there. There has never been any freedom to organize uh, in Syria. Uh, and those outside the country, that is the uh, Syrian National Council, uh, in the Free Syrian Army are not fully in touch with what's going on on the ground in Syria. Uh, in each and every 
village and city, there are local committees who are learning on the job how to organize themselves, how to resist through both peaceful means and through uh, increasingly in, uh, violence because the uh, nonviolent approach has met with uh, brutality, uh, many dead, many wounded, many brutalized, many arrested and tortured. Not all of them disappear because the regime has intentionally released a lot of people as broken and dispirited to go back to their families and their neighbors and let them know just how bad it is if you get swept up uh, by the, the Syrian uh, Mukhabarat, the security services. Sectarian tensions, unfortunately, are rising almost everywhere. And much like in Iraq, groups are starting to sort themselves out by neighborhoods and villages. I'm told that many of the Christians in Homs have left for the mountains where they have ancestral villages. Uh, Alawites have uh, you don't find mixed neighborhoods. Alawis and Homs are in Alawite neighborhoods. Uh, Sunnis, uh, if they stay in the city at all, are in Sunni neighborhoods. The Syrian economy uh, is collapsing, uh, not just because the tourism has dried up, but because of sanctions. It's very hard for the Syrians now to sell what little oil they have to export. Uh, and, uh, but the people who will suffer most as the economy collapses will be the middle class. Uh, the poor have always suffered, and uh, they'll continue to suffer. Uh, Russia, as Dr. Ajami pointed out, um, is supporting the regime. They clearly feel humiliated by perceived past foreign policy setbacks in places such as Libya and earlier, as Professor Ajami pointed out, Kosovo. They have long memories. Uh, they have been determined to block UN Security Council resolutions that would have any teeth, uh, or particularly those resolutions that would be passed under Chapter 7 uh, that would allow for uh, military, military and other sanctions if the regime violated the provisions of that Security Council resolution. And like the Professor Ajami, I never imagined for a minute that Kofi Annan's six points would be implemented because, again, it requires them to pull their troops out of cities and towns, uh, for the prisoners to be released uh, back into their communities, for people to be allowed to demonstrate peacefully, for a ceasefire to take hold, uh, it's not going to happen because, again, that would be, uh, a, uh, by the regime's lights, a formula for suicide. However, unlike Professor Ajami, I think the six points which were voted for by the entire Security Council may down the road have some utility. It's certainly not going to happen now, but I could envision some possibilities in the future. Turkey is, of course, the key country bordering Syria right now. It's the country that has both the armed forces and uh, is the country that is disposed to want to see uh, this regime uh, disappear. Uh, Erdogan feels in, uh, incredibly betrayed and insulted by Bashar. They, they and their wives even vacation together, and he can't believe that Bashar uh, flipped him off, much as he's flipped off everybody else uh, who's uh, come and gone. But Turkey is not going to take on greater responsibility without strong and clear backing from the United States and NATO. And as pointed out, this administration is not ready to even give a yellow light, let alone a green light. In any case, even if the Free Syrian Army and like groups were armed and trained they're not going to be any match anytime soon for Assad's forces. They by themselves uh, cannot overthrow this regime or defeat uh, the Syrian army uh, in uh, conventional military combat. Unlike some who believe they have clear policy prescriptions for the U.S. administration to end Assad's rule, 
and to deal Iran and Hezbollah a severe strategic blow, something that we all would welcome. I, for myself, have mostly questions, questions that in all likelihood do not conjure clear, forthright answers. For instance, can we remove the Assad family, which I think is desirable and even necessary, and hope to bring uh, about political liberalization and uh, pluralism in Syria? Who is going to take responsibility for dismantling the many uh, security and intelligence organizations in Syria? How much of the Syrian armed forces can be left intact? Who's going to keep order the day after? Who's going to prevent those who are aggrieved now and who have suffered so much, like the woman Professor Ajami described in the Turkish camp, who's virtually lost three of her children? Who's going to prevent people from taking revenge on their tormentors and their families and even others who are innocent? Uh, as in Lebanon, Iraq, and Bahrain, uh, Sunni Shia, the Alawis are not strictly speaking Shia. They're a very heterodox offshoot of Shiism that long ago went in its own direction along with the Druze. But the fact of the matter is, is there, there is pos the possibility of spillover from Syria into Lebanon, Iraq, and beyond because these tensions are very, very real between the Sunnis and Shias and Shia offshoots and getting worse by the day. And Bahrain, of course, is another example where Sunnis are ruling over a Shia majority population um, with very bad consequences. In my opinion, the US public has no stomach for American boots on the ground in yet another Arab Islamic country Yet I believe that air power is unlikely to be enough to unseat the Assads, although it could push them into real negotiations on perhaps something, a framework such as the Anan uh, six points. Uh, <clears throat> but the Syrians have watched what others have done, and they're likely to put their anti-aircraft batteries, their tanks, etc., and built up areas near hospitals, near schools, uh, near places where uh, where civilians congregate. So there's going to be, in military terms, almost certainly collateral damage. Uh, and it's not going to play well in Cairo, in Alexandria, in Baghdad, and even in places such as Saudi Arabia. So we have to consider all of this. It's not an excuse for doing nothing, but it's a cause for reflection. Uh, also, we may not be backing the same groups that Turkey's uh, Muslim brother, well, it's not a Muslim Brotherhood government, excuse me. The moderate Islamist government in Turkey might look at certain groups in the opposition as might Saudi Arabia and Qatar uh, and see them as preferable to the types of groups that we would like to see uh, coming to power and in the ascendancy. I don't recall any observer I know predicting that in Egypt, the Salafists would get 20% of the vote and the Muslim Brotherhood 50%. We were assured by knowledgeable analysts that at most they would get 30% of the parliamentary seats. So clearly there's a phenomena here that we don't understand very well uh, that is going on. By the way, I'm not against Islamists legitimately coming to power, but like most people, I don't want to see one man or woman one vote one time. We want to know that these people will be willing to give up power if voted out of office. Also, who's going to pay uh, for the reconstruction of Syria? Who's going to get the contracts? Who's going to implement it? Syria had a huge humanitarian crisis even before the fighting. There was a huge drought on, out on the Euphrates and its tributaries. And hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Syrians were leaving the land and coming into the cities as refugees with no place to go. How will Russia react if NATO uses military means without an authorizing UN Security Council resolution under Chapter 7? Uh, 
I'm concerned, you know, some people say uh, revenge is a dish best eaten cold. I'm not so sure that what happened in Kosovo uh, didn't trigger the Russians eventually going into Georgia and uh, backing independence for the Ossetians and the Abkhazians uh, in 2008. Uh, it seems to me that, as I said, they, these guys have long memories and very sharp teeth. Uh, and I think we also need to consider how will our going into Syria without a Security Council resolution affect the uh, five plus one talks with Iran, which I'm sure a number of people in this audience care deeply about, or with the resupply of our troops in Afghanistan. Again, I'm not saying that that is a reason to do nothing or that is a reason not to try to bring the friends of Syria along and uh, bring the Russians uh, along, but you've got to consider it. Uh, so there, there are a lot of uh, issues that are of concern. I don't have the answers, as I said. My strong sense is that the administration is right to proceed carefully. Again, I'm not their spokesman. I'm not here to defend them. I just happen to agree. Russia and China cannot be taken for granted or ignored, regardless of how odious we find their policies towards Syria. Meanwhile, our moves must be sequenced and deliberate. I think it's necessary to let the Anan plan play out for the next few weeks. And then we can confront the Russians again and say, OK, you didn't want a resolution with teeth. We've tried it your way. It hasn't worked. What do you suggest? People are getting killed. But you know, it's also for the Arab League and the organization of the Islamic Conference and uh, the non-aligned movement and others to start telling the Russians that there will be a price to be paid if they continue to support a despot uh, like Bashar al-Assad. All of it should not be on the US. Uh, so I believe in sequencing our moves. I believe in a slow and deliberate buildup. I realize that people are dying. Nobody needs to tell me that. I lived in Syria for seven years. I know a lot of Syrians. I enjoyed my time there. They're good people. They don't deserve this. But there are also two million people in Korea that have North Korea that have died of starvation, and we didn't invade. So, yes, we have, we have moral obligations here, but we have to think about how we exercise them. Uh, I think economic sanctions are having an effect. Again, I'm not saying they're going to bring down the regime, but they're weakening the regime. They're degrading the regime. It's going to be very hard to pay, you know, your loyalists to give them the kinds of goodies they've been used to, uh, to maintain their loyalty when the pound is almost worthless. And we have to do better with the opposition. We have to encourage them to speak out more about the minorities and to tell them, look, what we're trying to do is drive a wedge between much of the professional military and the Assad regime. But right now, all Alawites think they're going to get in the neck if you guys come to power. They see a jihadi and a Salafi behind every rifle that you have. Uh, and they're determined that if anybody's going to be killed, it's going to be you, not them, and not their families. We can also uh, do better on sharing intelligence with the opposition, continue to supply them with communication equipment. And I'm not an uh, expert on uh, the internet and the like, but I would like to think we could jam some Syrian communications and disrupt some of their uh, command and control. Perhaps we can also further reposition U.S. strategic assets in the Middle East and the Eastern Mediterranean as another signal to the Russians and the Syrians that patience is wearing thin. But to my mind, military intervention, while it may be necessary, is not the first action. It's the last resort. Thank you. Ted, thank you very much. Uh, Peter. Um, it's a great pleasure to, uh, and a privilege to be able to talk to you tonight and especially to uh, share a panel with these speakers. Um, for many years, in fact about 20 or 30 years ago when I, I started writing about uh, the Arab world, I was extremely impressed by Fuad Ajami because he was one of those who said 
at a time when many people were arguing that Arabs were not ready for democracy or that there was something cultural in the Arab world that prevented uh, a Western conception of democratic values taking hold, he was one who said, no, these are universal values. Arabs aspire to them just like everyone else. And now in the past two years, or, or slightly less, we've seen his argument being gloriously vindicated in many countries in the Middle East. So it's, a, it's, it's extremely pleasing for me to be on uh, the same panel as him. I say that partly to butter him up before I say that I disagree vehemently with what he, uh, <laughs> what he just told you. Um, I think uh, it is a, a brutal and miserable, piteous thing that, that's happening in Syria right now. And he's quite right to be outraged by the fact that once again, it seems, the world stands by while innocent people have terrible atrocities visited on them. But I nonetheless feel that much as we would like to, to believe that the 7th Cavalry or the, um, the 202nd um, uh, uh, par um, Air Brigade could move into, um, uh, into Syria and solve this problem, that, that a big military operation is the answer, I fear that's, um, that's not necessarily correct. Um, and I, I say this for many reasons. The first one is, I do believe that the um, Assad regime is not only ruthless, as it's shown, ruthless in the sense that it is, hap it is willing to kill thousands of its own citizens in order to hold on to power, but it's extremely strong. It has an army that is not, I don't believe is a, an army that's wearing slippers and ready to run away. It's an army that has uh, fought serious enemies, Israel, for example, and proved very ferocious on the battlefield. It's um, absolutely well-armed with heavy armor, with um, helicopter gunships, with the moderately sized air force. There's no way that um, providing arms to the Syrian opposition forces will ever equalize that struggle. Um, it's a regime that seems to have the support of a very large segment of the population. Not just the Alawis, but also the Christian groups who are sheltering with the Alawis for safety. Um, and there have been, as I understand it, actually very few defections of uh, large numbers of troops from the army to the to the opposition. The army has proved distressingly loyal. It seems to me that what has been decided within the, within the country by the group in charge is that we hang together or we will hang separately and they will see this through to the end. Uh, Professor Jami um, mocked uh, the Obama administration for saying all the time that um, Syria is not Libya. But they have a point. They have a point that deserves to be taken seriously. Uh, first of all, Syria does have, as Libya didn't, um, the protection of strong powers. Not just the Russians who give diplomatic cover, who provide arms, who need to be taken seriously, but also uh, powerful neighbors, uh, Iran, Hezbollah. Um, I think that is a very big distinction between Libya and Syria and should give us pause for thought before we decide that a military intervention is the answer. Um, the location of Syria is another reason why um, it, it is really a different kettle of fish, or a different kettle of piranhas, I should probably say, uh, uh, from, from Libya. It is in the most delicate possible position. It's on the borders of um, Iran and of Israel, of Turkey, of Lebanon, Iraq, and one can see that the tribal and sectarian conflicts that exist in Syria have ramifications in pretty much all the, all its all the neighborhood. Um, if there were to be some kind of messy intervention that had, had uh, an, no clean conclusion, we could be in for a long period of uh, civil strife spreading over the borders of the Middle East. Now, why is the Obama administration hanging back? It's obvious. I think Gore Vidal once called the United States the United States of amnesia. 
But everyone in this country remembers that it's not very long ago that there was a big American war, led war in the Middle East, that we decided to go and uh, uh, topple Saddam Hussein. Whatever you think about that decision, look at how the moral, how the humanitarian calculus played out afterwards. Those who said it would be a cakewalk were completely right. It was a cakewalk. The war took very little time at all. But the occupation of uh, Iraq led to a terrible tribal and sectarian struggle that claimed, what, 100,000 lives? That's probably the lowest estimate you'll hear. It's terrible that 10,000 or so Syrians have lost their lives over the past 14 months. But it could be a lot worse. And if an army removes the Syrian regime and isn't prepared to stay behind in large numbers to pacify the country, it could well be that the same sectarian strife will take, take, grip, uh, take, take, take a grip of the Syrians and the humanitarian uh, consequences will be worse than, than the suffering that we see now on the ground. I'd like to remind you also on the, that uh, next door to Syria and Lebanon, a much smaller country, uh, there was a civil war that lasted 14 years. 14 years with the same witch's brew of, 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 of sects and tribes struggling for domination. Is it really conceivable that the United States in its current mood, at a time of demoralization, at a time when it is trying to rebuild its own economy, when it's coming out of difficult conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq, is really going to have the strategic patience to go into a country as complex as Syria, to keep the peace after it's gone in, to find its way towards, to, to guide a political settlement there, it's totally inconceivable. It's, it's pie in the sky. So my reluctant conclusion is that it won't happen. Um, I don't think there are, I, have not, I don't have an alternative plan to offer. I think we are in for a very long, uh, low-grade war that will cost more lives. One hopes that at some point the balance of forces might shift against the regime or that some external actors will be able to persuade the Assad family to step down, but I think it's unlikely. As I said, I think they're in for the long haul and there's no getting rid of them. So I don't claim to have an answer, but what I'm sure of is that a big military intervention by the United States is neither going to happen and it probably shouldn't happen. So thank you. Peter thank, you, Peter, thank you very much. Th this is actually a fascinating range of opinion because we have three different views that were expressed by Fuad, by Ted, and by Peter. Uh, Fuad presented the policy prescription of attack now from the air. Ted offered the policy prescription of it should be a last resort. Let diplomacy play itself out, tighten the noose, and if none of that works, then consider, as a last resort, using your words, military action. And Peter offered the analysis that Assad is just too strong, and Syria itself is just too hard and too dangerous to do. So military action under no circumstances conceivable in the, current, in the current environment. Three different perspectives, three perspectives that I'm quite sure different members of the administration, three cases that are being made around the table in the situation room. Now, so far, it seems to me that case, that uh, prescription, uh, somewhere between prescription two and prescription three is the dominant view. Tighten, tighten sanctions, pursue diplomacy to the end, undertake some outreach to the opposition in non-lethal contacts, and ask the military for some contingency plans for the possible eventual use of military force but nothing of that sort on the horizon anytime soon. So I'd like to ask each of the panelists 
to take a look at their prescription. And I'd like to ask very specifically about the biggest critique of their prescription and say whether that changes their view under what circumstance it might change their view. And so first, Fuad, the critique of this prescription, one could argue is, we'd be involved for another 10 years. You break it, you own it, said Secretary Powell. Is this indeed something that you believe not only is right and appropriate, but for an organization that focuses on practical policy, something that the American people could accept? Ted, for you, what in fact would trigger a change? Or is not the idea of last resort merely a verbal gymnastics tool to keep postponing doing something through another round of diplomacy and another round of sanctions. And Peter, is there some point when the carnage in Syria actually takes on a determinative life of its own? Some point when the image, some picture, something in Syria transforms and overcomes all the obstacles you outlined and just motivates action despite the hesitations and the complications that you laid out. So gentlemen, these three challenges to your specific alternatives. Four. I mean, this man is impossible with his... <laughs> that is a very brilliant summation. You're asking me to falsify my own premise. Um, I'll, I'll just, I'll steal something from, you know, uh, to, is that, is that, does that work? Yeah. Maybe I'll just jump on, on Peter's uh, rather than mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a Syrian Srebrenica. A Syrian Srebrenica. Because in fact, we know very well that President Bill Clinton was, had no interest in intervening in Bosnia and his hand was forced. Luckily, he had someone working for him. May God bless his memory, Richard Holbrook. There should be a statue of him in Bosnia. And we had to do the, we had to intervene in, in Bosnia when we didn't really want to. And I think we know the results in Bosnia. They were, they were superb results. We rescued the Bosnian people from extinction, practically, without losing a soldier. Now, in terms of just answering yeah, I understand the case. The American people are tired. They, there has been disillusionment with the war in Iraq. But remember, I never called in writing about Syria all the time. You know, every time I call the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal, they say, oh, not another Syria piece, is it? I say, yes, it's another Syria piece. But in writing about Syria, I never called, actually, for boots on the ground. I, for the most part, it's really something that will emerge in the other Syria discussion today. We need a no-fly, no-drive zone on the border between Turkey and Syria, and then let the Syrians fight for their own freedom as they have been fighting for their own freedom. So, yeah, I know the reluctance of the, of the Obama administration. I understand all the, more, all the economic reasons, the sense of fatigue. But look, this to me, this moment, is the Arabs 1989. This Arab awakening, this is the chance for the Arab world to assert some kind of belief in freedom. And I think Syria has become the test of this. And Syria is the place where this battle between freedom and despotism in the Arab world is playing out. Now, I don't know if you will allow me this, but there is a, someone recently sent me you can imagine, He's, someone sent me a fan letter, you know, and if you don't, I do have fans. They're not on this panel, but, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I do have fans. So a, a person, you know, so I received this note, you know, very intimate apparently, Dear Fuad, it's from Dallas, Texas. So this reader said, I read with the interest your article in today's Wall Street Journal. As usual, your defense of freedom was lucid and powerful. That's, that's quite nice. I agree wholeheartedly with you that America must lead 
and that failure to do so creates universal weakness. I also agree with your strategic insight that a new Syria will weaken Iran and thereby advance peace. Isolationism as a result of lack of confidence in the goodness of our country is hard to watch. Thank you for speaking out. George W. Bush. Now, this is, if you, if you allow me again, that was a good letter. I also wrote him a good response, which I would like to share with you, because it will tell you what my case is all about. So I say to him, dear President Bush, Mr. President, what a great honor to, hear, to get your kind notes. I truly treasure it. I can't believe you took the time to write it, and I shall keep it. It goes to, into a collection that my beloved granddaughter, Layla, age five, has from you. A signed photograph when she was born, a previous letter of yours in the immediate aftermath of your presidency, and now this splendid gift. I didn't tell him that also in her collection is one of the most unbelievably negative, horrific letters I received from President Bill Clinton, but that's for another story. <laughs> so I said, the Arabs have a saying that in the darkest of nights, we miss the light. I may be biased, but this is my view. It was the misfortune of the noble Syrian people to rise in rebellion when you were in private life. I told many of the Syrian leaders I met in Istanbul the other day that timing was not on their side, that the American president who would have ridden to the rescue was now in Dallas. It pains me to read Secretary Clinton, I spoke of this berating the Syrian people, etc. Then I said, I extend to you and Mrs. Bush the best wishes, finally, a very important passage. I said, you gave us an honorable record defending freedom in the Middle East and insisting that Arabs and Muslims did not have tyranny in their DNA. Rob was telling us about the Scholar Statesman Award when Natan Sharansky and Saad Dean Ibrahim came to New York. I was in the audience. I was truly moved by these two men. I believe in freedom, and I believe in the cause of freedom. I know it's difficult. I know it's difficult, but I think the stakes in Syria justify the sacrifices, they're not boots on the ground. They're not boots on the ground. There is a whole lot that could be done to aid the Syrian people without enlisting American forces. Talk to Senator McCain and Lieberman. They were in the camps, in the refugee camps, literally the same day I was there. So there's a lot that could be done. Ted? I spoke of, uh, well, the question is what would trigger a last resort? Uh, and I think Rob, is, it's fair for him to point out, couldn't that just be a, another way of saying we don't really want to do nothing or kick the can down the road until after the elections? And I'm not saying there aren't probably some political advisors who want to do just that. But, and I don't want to whip a dead horse, I really don't. But the fact of the matter is, is the people who thought they knew Iraq before we went into Iraq, didn't think we needed to plan much for the day after. They thought we could turn things over to certain Iraqis, and they could immediately start running their own affairs, and, and we could leave uh, with those rose petals uh, and uh, rice that was thrown in our uh, path. Uh, Don Rumsfeld famously said, as the museum of, National Museum of Iraq was being looted, stuff happens. Well, now we know stuff does happen. And somebody's got to have boots on the ground. The Syrian, free Syrian army and these committees are not going to be able to use some enclave along the Turkish border, in my opinion, even with US air power, to throw Assad out of power. You might end up with warlordism, you might end up with something like Afghanistan looked like after the Soviets left. But, so I'm not a strategist. Uh, we have plenty of those, but I'm not one of them. But it seems to me that even as you're tightening the noose and you're getting, you're getting as much pressure on Russia as you possibly can over this whole thing, you're talking to Turkey, you're talking to Saudi Arabia, you're talking to NATO, and you're, you're starting to plan, okay, if this doesn't work, what is our plan C? Uh, what are, who's prepared to do what? Because we know these problems exist. They're not theoretical. We've seen them happen in Iraq. We know what happens when there's these pent-up hatreds and nobody's in charge. 
And therefore, I think you start planning uh, multinationally uh, for it, and you try to get the legal framework, if at all possible, to, to let it go ahead. Peter, thank you, Ted. Peter, what would change your calculus? Srebrenica? I think it would have to be more than Srebrenica. Um, Could you speak right into the mic? Yes. Um, clearly, clearly there, there, would, there comes a point in any conflict where the scale of um, suffering and killing and atrocity uh, becomes impossible to do for, for, the, for, for the rest of the world to, to do nothing about. Um, with what we know now, um, it, 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 looking back at the Holocaust, it seems it, no one would dream of defending the idea of um, doing nothing to, uh, to, to, to stop that in its tracks. Um, however, um, I'm going to sound terribly cold with what I, what I say here, but, but um, you know, the 10,000 deaths in Syria are terrible, but we have done nothing about much worse suffering in North Korea, for example. We did nothing to prevent the civil war in the Congo, which cost perhaps a million plus lives. Um, why? Well, who cares about the Congo, especially in Washington, D.C.? Um, but my opt so at some point, yes, if it got terrible, we, 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 all feel, we, we would all feel even more than we do now that it, there was a moral imperative to intervene. But my argument is, is that there is another moral imperative, and that is to weigh the consequences of our intervention and try to reach some uh, estimate of whether we might make things worse rather than better. And that's why I think the example of Iraq remains very strong. I know Ted said he didn't want to whip a dead horse, but this is our most recent example in a very similar part of the world next door neighbor, same sectarian divisions almost, where what happened after a successful military intervention was the unleashing of forces that even a fairly large American army with boots on the ground wasn't for a long time able to control. And the result of that was a massive loss of life, huge disruption of the population, refugees internally and externally, Really, I mean, we don't, we, you must all remember how black things looked in Iraq for a very long time after, after the successful military operation to topple Saddam Hussein. So, yes, um, if things get very bad, we will re-examine um, the, the, the moral case for going in, but I say always, the moral case for going in has to be balanced against the moral case for not making things worse. First, do no harm is not a bad principle in geopolitics as well as in medicine. And then just one last comment on, on, on something that Fuad said, which was Syria is the tipping point of the Arab awakening. I'm not quite sure that an American military intervention um, would help the Arab awa awakening along. First of all, the Arab awakening has already in, impinged on the biggest countries, the most populous countries in the Middle East. It's not as if the Arab world is sitting there looking at Syria and thinking, the people of the Arab world, do we want freedom or, do, or don't we? They're not going to change their minds one way or another, uh, depending on whether Assad survives longer rather than a shorter time. So I don't think um, um, America can go in and save the Arab awakening by crushing Assad. I think that uh, the Americans are the wrong people to do it, would send a wrong message to the Arab world. Um, so I, I rest my case on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm now gonna turn to, uh, to the audience for questions, if you could please Actually, if you could turn the lights up just a little bit. If you could, uh, if you could please identify to whom you're posing the question. Um, I'll start uh, with Dennis Ross in the center right. Thank you.
Uh, I actually have a, a question for Fuad and then a question for Peter and, uh, and Ted. Fuad, I basically have a sense that you're probably right that the Syrians may be more like the Serbs than we think, but there is an important question, what if you're wrong? And if you are wrong, while many people make an assumption right now that this kind of an intervention in Syria would make the difference, uh, not so much in terms of the Arab awakening, but vis-a-vis -vis Iran, if it turns out you're wrong and the U.S. is involved in a much longer period of time than you're, than you're proposing, it may well tie the American hands as it relates to Iran uh, in terms of dealing with the nuclear question. So while many people sort of make a connection between Syria and Iran and how it will move things in a favorable way vis-a-vis -vis Iran, one could envision a circumstance where if there's an intervention and it turns out to be harder than you assume, then it may well end up tying American hands on a different question, and I would be interested in your reaction to that. Peter and Ted, I would like to pose the following. There are many people who actually are against uh, or justify not becoming more activists now because they say it will add to the violence in Syria, it will deepen the civil war, it'll make it more likely the neighboring countries get involved, uh, it will increase the, the weight of the radical Islamists there, uh, and therefore that becomes an argument for not doing it. But one could actually make just the opposite argument. One could actually say, the longer the conflict goes on, the more certain that the sectarian lines harden to the point that they can't be repaired. The killing, in a sense, is going to contribute not to, what, to the idea that there's going to be a civil war, that there already is a civil war, that the central authority within Syria will break down, and that, in effect, all the big fears about, uh, that are caused if one intervenes now, in fact, the longer this conflict goes on, will almost certainly materialize over time. So if one decides not to, to intervene and hold back, you may be producing the very thing that most people fear today is going to materialize. So I would like your answer to that, actually both uh, you and Ted. Thank you. For what? Um, well, first of all, giving Dennis the right to ask questions is amazing. We should be asking him questions. <laughs> he knows more than we do about the workings of these policies. I think this is a very interesting question, Dennis. I'm thinking, you know, about two decades ago, I was very, very exercised, just as I am. Apparently, I just get exercised about these issues. I was very deeply outraged by what was happening in Bosnia. I thought the ordeal of Sarajevo was one of the great human questions of the time. And everybody kept saying, oh, you can't do anything about the Serbs. They tied down 37 Nazi divisions. What do you know about the, the Serbs? They are mighty. So guess what I said? I said, they don't have it. The US Air Force will destroy them. What did I know? Nothing. Nothing. And the US Air Force destroyed them. And there was, I still remember now, a name from the Balkan troubles, Scott O'Grady. Do you remember him? He was a pilot who was shot down behind Serbian lines and was rescued. So we didn't even lose Scott O'Grady. We got Scott O'Grady back. I truly believe, again, just an instinct. I'm not a military expert. You have military expert. I truly believe the Syrian army is in a lamentable condition. And again and again, I don't think that it's our mission. It's the Syrians who will bring it down with these humanitarian zones. And I think I learned one thing from my better. You know, for a while I actually acquired a fir new first name, and you know what the end was? People would always say, Bernard Lewis and, you know, Fuad Ashami say this and this. I learned one thing from Bernard. This is a region that respects power and might. I think the Iranians would be much easier to deal with if they administered a true beating, a true drubbing in Damascus. If the people watched them, if you will, that they invested themselves in the Bashar regime and they, saw, and they see the Bashar regime biting the dust. So I think we'll have even more opportunities, we'll have more space if in, the, in the aftermath of the defeat of Bashar, Bashar, Bashar Assad and the destruction of his regime.
Uh, uh, Peter and then Ted. Peter. Uh, Dennis, I think I think that's um, a very powerful point. That, um, uh, as I think um, I, I artlessly admitted in my initial talk, the likelihood, if not, no one intervenes, is that this war will continue. This, what do you want to call it, insurgency, civil war, whatever, will continue and get worse over a period of time. So you might very well end up with with the. Um, the situation that I, I warn would um, uh, come into being after an American intervention. It may, that might be the case. I, you know, no one can be a clairvoyant. But there would be one very big difference, uh, which I think is important, is important, even though it sounds callous, which is that in the case of a non-intervention, who would own that problem? It wouldn't be the United States. And I think that's an important thing in the region, that if chaos is triggered by an American intervention in, in Syria. And, you know, that's one thing. If chaos comes about gradually because of what's unfolding in Syria now, that's a completely different thing. And my guess is that it's better for the region as well as for the United States if the United States is not seen as the creator of the chaotic aftermath. But I know that sounds callous, but I think that's, that's the way it is. Ted? No surprise, Dennis got to the heart of the matter, asked a very cogent question. Uh, and uh, if I were in the administration and I was trying to argue the case for going in, for doing something sooner rather than later to bring the Assad regime down uh, and try to bring this to an end, I would use that very argument, that the longer this goes on, uh, the more hatreds, that are generated on all sides, uh, the more chaos, and the more likely that the most extreme elements in the opposition, the Salafists, the you know, uh, jihadis, uh, thugs, we saw that in Lebanon, Fuad, right? I mean, criminal gangs, I've already heard about criminal gangs operating in Syria, kidnappings and all, it has nothing to do, you know, they might masquerade as belonging to the opposition or whatever, or, or the regime, but you have gangs that are making money, as they always do in this kind of situation. So there is a case you could make for doing something sooner rather than later. But again, it's a cost-benefit. You have to weigh, are you really going to be able to stop this bloodshed? We, Peter just noted in Iraq. Uh, remember people were having, uh, you know, literally you were having chainsaw massacres going on in neighborhoods of uh, uh, Baghdad and the like. People were found decapitated uh, after horrible torture. So what makes us think by going in we can prevent, uh, going in sooner, uh, we're going to be able to prevent this? I think it's much better if we're going to go in that we've tried the other options, i.e. diplomacy, pressure, sanctions, and the like, and that if we do go in, we have a plan that actually might work, and people committed to uh, staying there, because it can't be us. Um, thank you. I turn to the floor in just a moment. I, I just wanted, I don't often inject into these conversations as moderator, but I wanted to report when I was in, I came back a few weeks ago from, from two of the other borders of Syria, from Jordan and, and Israel, and the, the common assessment there that I came away with was um, of, uh, of three options. Um, uh, Assad fighting it out and winning, um, uh, a quick change through the help of outside powers, or the slower process of, of, this lo of longer term, we'll see where things go over time. The one both Jordanians and the Israelis feared the most was the third. Because in their view, and one can accept it or reject it, in their view, that outcome almost surely would bring about the most radical outcome. Um, even think. more radical than, than Assad staying in power, as much as, that, uh, um, as, much as uh, horrific as that can imagine. Um, and so that was their common assessment of, uh, of outcomes. Of course, they don't have responsibility for U.S. forces, etc., but analytically, that was their common view. Um, Marvin Kalb here, and, uh, and then Mark over here, and we have a couple of others. 
Thank you very much. Um, Fouad said in a jocular but also dismissive way that President Obama was leading from behind in Syria. And that may be the case, but maybe the president knows a few things that um, we don't. For example, and I'd like to focus on two points especially. One is that the United States right now, if you take a look at public opinion polls, which I study, 67% of the American people right now want us out of Afghanistan, and 54% want us out immediately. And that includes a lot of Republicans as well. That suggests to me that there is a mood in this country not to take on another war with another Muslim country, and here I align myself with what Peter was suggesting in his comments, but rather to hold back, because we may not be in a position to do that. A second point, the U.S. Pentagon budget for this year has already been drastically cut back. If there is not an agreement on the budget by the end of the year, according to a screwy arrangement, that was reached by the Congress, there is going to be an enforced further cut in the budget. And if you talk to American military people, which I've had the privilege to do in recent weeks, they are extremely worried about the capacity of the United States to take on another war at this time. I add to that simply that at a certain point, the American people, I think, intuitively now are dismissing the idea that the United States is the moral policeman in the world, that there is a point at which we cannot go much further, and we may very well be at that point right now. And I raise that simply for your consideration. Why don't we take, why don't we take a few, uh, few remarks, and then I'll turn back to, uh, to my panel. Um, Mark Ginsburg, please. Right in the middle, please. First of all, I want to congratulate each of you before, for the comments that you've made. I've just come back from three back-to-back -back trips to uh, Turkey. The premise of each of your presentations was on almost exclusively the intervention of the United States. Mrs. Clinton stated to President Assad, reform or get out of the way. The issue to me is not whether or not the United States, uh, either unilaterally or arbitrarily, can do the things that you suggested either should not be done or could not be done. Fuad raised the point that there are many things that we could be doing. So I turn Mrs. Clinton's comment around and say to the Obama administration, get out of the way. The Turks and the Arab League have expressed a willingness to do an accretion of activities against the Assad regime, and yet when Mrs. Clinton was on her way to Turkey for the last Friends of Syria meeting, her instructions were to stop the Turks and the Arab League from doing more than that they were prepared to do. The question I have for you is what harm is it for the United States to get out of the way and permit the Arab League and the Turks to do whatever they may be prepared to do Without, have, without having the United States actively feel that it's involved in a slippery slope. Thank you very much. Um, on, the, on the right, uh, Charles Albert, and then Sam Tadros. I would like to suggest that uh, this uh, discussion is not directed in the uh, point in which concerns me and uh, we act in uh, countries, other countries, when it's to our benefit or we are concerned about a tax or whatever. I would suggest that Iran is a much more serious problem than this. I would suggest that we have uh, discussed almost all day long about what we can do to prevent 
an, a, a nuclear attack on Israel or uh, another neighbor in that area because they don't have the delivery power uh, to reach us. I would suggest that we have sufficient intelligence to know when the Syrian government meets and Assad is there and wipe them all out. <laughs> that would be uh, a notice to Iran maybe to stop further development. And I, I, I direct my comments to the whole panel. That, that was a, a variation of Dennis's more diplomatically posed question yes. about <laughs> the implications toward Iran. Thank you. Uh, Sam? Yes, hi. Samuel Tadros of the Hudson Institute. Uh, for Ad, you used the term the Arab Awakening, and the first Arab Awakening coincided with a drawing of the map of the Middle East. Ten years from now, the question in Libya, but also more importantly in Syria, emerges. Is the new Arab Awakening going to have redrawing of the map of the Middle East? Is, will we have a Syria in 10 years from now? Thank you. All right, why don't we take this group of questions? Um, 12, would you like to begin? Well, first of all, on um, an act of God of the United States Air Force getting rid of uh, Bashar, uh, as we say in, in, in Arabic, uh, from your mouth to the ears of God, or, or to the gates of heaven. I know both the Arabs and the Jews have equivalent expression. Um, you know, Mark Ginsburg says something very important. The United States is not only not helping the Syrian rebellion, but I bring you news delivered to me by both the Turks and the Syrian opposition leaders. A while ago, the Libyans wanted to send weapons to the Syrian rebellion, and the United States discouraged that. So the old saw of lead, follow, or get out of the way applies to the United States. We don't want to lead, it's too expensive. We don't want to follow, we're too proud. We don't want to get out of the way, we're too big. I think that's what needs to be changed. Now, I think the question of Sam is really quite interesting. And the question in Syria will be of some importance because people are talking about possibly a scenario of partition of Syria. I mean, Syria is kind of a contrived entity in many ways. When the French ruled it, they had the state of, in Syria, they had the state of the Alawis, they had the state of the, the, the Druze, and they have greater Lebanon. And in fact, many people now say, if the Alawis can't rule the rest of Syria, you know, the Alawis were always, this is a very difficult thing for them. At some point, their hegemony in Syria was going to be broken. You can't have 12% of the population of Syria rule the rest. Not only that, the great North African historian, Ibn Khaldun, who is like the greatest sociologist the, in, the, in, the, in the Middle Ages, he said, people always follow the religion of their kings. See, but in Syria, it can't be so. Because the people who rule are not only a minority, but they're a despised minority. They're a despised minority. I can tell you in my own boyhood, which wasn't so long ago, Alawi young women were brought to homes in Beirut and to homes of prosperous families basically for indentured servitude. So the Alawis have moved, if you will, from this being the dregs of Syria to being the rulers of Syria. And that's something anomalous in the human condition. So I think there is a possibility that if the Alawis, this is the scenario people always invoke, if they can't rule the rest of Syria, they will retreat into the Alawi mountains and the coast, where they are, if you will, in a majority, and they will defend their position. So maybe the question of Syria's borders, I think, will be raised in the months and years ahead. Thank you. Peter. Uh, you can press the button. To, to the very um, uh, uh, correct observation that, that, that people in America don't seem to, many people in America are, are tired of uh, the United States having to be the world's moral policeman. I think that's true, but I do think it's important to add that if the United States isn't the world's moral policeman, there probably won't be anyone at all to be the moral policeman if 
situations develop that really do demand some intervention. Thank you. Um, I don't, I, I have to admit, I, I, I haven't been informed of this uh, desire of the Turks to um, move a, so far ahead of the, um, the Americans in taking action in Syria. I suspect that uh, this might be something that is useful to say and part of the general passing of the buck that goes on at times like this. Um, the Turks could, there are options the Turks could, could, um, could have, you know, the, the, the setting up of a safe zone for the opposition and so forth. But my most recent understanding was that they wanted the United States and NATO uh, to sign off on this and they wanted help on it. And um, again, this goes back to the moral policeman point. I'm afraid that unless the Americans move, no one moves. They are the sine qua non, as we saw in, in Libya, and the same will apply uh, to, um, to, to, to Syria. Therefore, just getting out of the way, I don't think, will actually change the situation very much. I do agree that Iran is a very serious problem, but um, as a non-American, I think I'm a little bit leery of the idea that the United States Air Force should just take out any government of which it doesn't approve. I don't think that is a very good way to conduct international relations, even though I belong to um, a country with which you have a special relationship, thank goodness. Um, so you're safe. <laughs> safe. <yeah. laughs> um, redrawing the map of the Middle East. Um, well, um, Mr. Sykes and Monsieur Pico tried doing that once, and it didn't have very good consequences. Um, it's quite true that uh, you know, the, the, uh, the sectarian map of, of, the, of, of the Arab world does not uh, fit neatly with uh, the, the, the present national state map of, of the Arab world, but the same is true of many parts of the world. But I think it's a very bad principle to believe that you should um, uh, reorganize national boundaries so that nations become tribes, essentially. And the, 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 the globalized world that we live in can't be reorganized in that way and, and, um, and, and shouldn't be. Thank you. And Ted? Before I answer the questions, two very quick observations. Uh, one, I think I have to speak for the Syrian people and say that Lebanon looks to me like the more artificial creation. People used to go with their Ottoman passports to the United States and would say Tripoli or Sidon, Syria. So just to, <laughs> you know, as, as to who was artificial. The Syrians feel that uh, uh, Sykes and Picot denied them their birthright and that much of the Mushrik, much of the Arab East should be theirs. Uh, to say nothing of Israel, but anyway, that's another story. Uh, I also think Hillary Clinton has been getting slammed uh, a bit unfairly. I've, uh, analysis is not my day job, I run an NGO, so just like in college I cram for occasions like this and I read a lot of her statements and whatever she said in February, she's really toughened her statements up and on April 19th when there was that meeting in Istanbul of the Friends of Syria, she, she issued uh, more than veiled threats to Syria about uh, what further actions could be uh, uh, taken. Uh, <clears throat> The, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the U.S. getting out of the way, I, Mark, I would say this, that certainly in my presentation, the thing I envision is that Turkey is a key player, and U.S. and NATO provide air power, and Turkey provides, frankly, the boots on the ground, along maybe with some coalition of the willing, uh, uh, a couple Arab League states, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, like, because I, I think we're all in agreement that the American people will not stand for a long U.S. engagement in Syria and that others are going to have to do the heavy lifting uh, the day after. The important thing is that everybody's agreed and knows their roles and is willing to uh, abide by certain uh, principles, uh, in, in my opinion. Is there anything on left? Thank you. Um, uh, just a couple more, and then we're going to close the evening. Dave Pollack. Yeah, thank you. For uh, the presenters who are arguing that American military intervention would be a bad idea, 
because it might make things worse or because it's premature, it's a last resort. Um, what would you do now, if anything? Is there nothing that we can do to provide more humanitarian support, more safety for the Syrian people, or to support the opposition in some way that would not make things worse, that would at least give them a chance? I don't see that the argument or the observation that there are other cases in which we did nothing, like North Korea, is really a good argument for not doing anything in this case. On the contrary, where we can do something, we should think about what we can do. So I turn the question back to you and ask you, what can we do? And in that vein, I would just suggest the possibility of helping to create the kind of safe zone in Syria or something analogous to it that we quite successfully did in Iraq for the Kurds for over a decade, which did not involve boots on the ground, which did not make the situation worse and lead to a sectarian civil war or mass killings, but which did succeed in protecting a very significant part of that country's population that was under grave and immediate threat of massacre. Thank you. Thank you. If I can just add to that David's question with the following um, uh, variable. Uh, in fact, um, for the, with, with all the panelists so far, we haven't really heard the, the voice of the Syrian people themselves. Um, uh, now, perhaps there's been a debate, a policy debate, over the last year and a half, to what extent is the Syrian people speaking with one voice? Um, but the question I would pose is, let us assume that there is no longer any, um, uh, any controversy, any, any um, uh, debate about this. And we did have the sense, the clear sense, that the people of Syria themselves were now asking for some sort of intervention. Would that make a difference? Would that make a difference? Um, in terms of the calculus of whether or not the U.S. with like-minded nations should act. Gentlemen. You want me to start? Well, why don't no, we go the other direction? There, Ted. There, right. Well, let me, let me start with David's question. Um, it might have been un unsatisfying, but I think I did try to lay out some things that we should and, uh, be doing, and I talked about the need to sequence steps and not rush in uh, with military intervention. And so I hate to keep coming back to it, but just because Russia has stopped two United Nations security resolutions, it doesn't mean that that has to be their position for all time. Uh, I think it's time for a sit down between our president and Putin and for the, you know, president to look him in the eye and say, okay, what do you really need? What's, what's the problem here for you? What national interests do you see that are so vital that it's worth Russia blackening its name with much of the Arab world, uh, many other nations, uh, hurting relations with NATO, and driving a wedge between our two countries when we have so many other more important issues to discuss. So naive as I may be, I still think there's a chance that over time the Russians can be brought along to at least uh, abstain. But I think we have to figure out, I think A, there's, they feel, I, I'm not saying it's right, I'm not saying we should kiss their butt, but I think they're feeling a bit disrespected and we have to say, look, Let's work together on this. We have so many issues uh, that the world needs us to work together on. And plus, we're not ready right now to go in. And it, it's, it's gonna require a coalition. Uh, it's gonna require a number of countries, and we can't do it, as we've just said, we can't do it on our own. And the Syrian opposition is disunited, and they're not speaking with one voice, and I don't blame them, I mean, I understand why that is but I don't think we're going to get that kind of a request, that they're going to be able to speak with one voice. But if they could, then we can ask some things of them. And, it's, and we better ask some things of them. And you know, tell them, here's the way you know, it's, it's gonna need to be if you want foreign military intervention. You know, there's not gonna be any 
you know, you guys are going to work within a system that reduces the chances of getting into the kind of situation we saw in Iraq in 2005, 2006. Thank you. Peter? Uh, I don't think the safe zones are, are a terribly bad idea. It's, it's actually the, as it happens, it's the, it's the policy, the newspaper that I work for advocates. Um, but um, I don't think it's a full answer, and it, it's, it's obviously freighted with all kinds of problems. What if the Syrians attack the safe zone? Is, is the Turkish army actually going to go to war with Syria? That, that would be um, you know, a, a big event, because as I argued earlier, I think the Syrian army is actually a very strong army that's been involved in proper wars, unlike, um, unlike the Turks recently. Um, um, I don't have a solution. I think, um, you know, uh, my, my, my initial remarks were really a rebuttal of the solution that I, I, I heard from, from Fuad Ajami, which seemed to me to be arguing for, a, a, if not a fully-fledged American military intervention, then um, an aerial intervention, which to my mind is willing the end without really willing the means. I don't think intervening by air power alone in the, in the, in the Syrian situation would achieve the result that is desired. It won't be another Libya. And eventually, unless some boots, someone's boots go on the ground in large numbers for a very long time, the country will not be pacified. So I don't, I'm afraid I, 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 I'm just not in the position of having a solution. I think this is a horrible conflict that is likely to go on for um, a while, but would be exacerbated by a big American military intervention by air or by land. Um, I do think it makes a difference what the uh, Syrians themselves say they want, um, not least or because they are the people best able to judge the results of an intervention. So, um, but, you know, uh, there are many uh, voices coming out of Syria and they don't all um, advocate the, the same thing. Thank you. For what? Well, Saying that we want people to speak with one voice always troubles me. I live on the Upper West Side in Manhattan, so I, I can tell you that in my building, when I get into the elevator, there are people who don't want to get into the elevator with me because I supported the Iraq war. So speaking with one voice is not a requirement that I, I pose. David Pollack said something which I like, which is the use of American power to shelter the people of Kurdistan. I spend a lot of time in Kurdistan. I serve on the board of a university in Kurdistan, the American University of Iraq in Suleymaniyah. And with all its troubles, Kurdistan is a thriving place. It's a thriving place. It's a decent place. There's a fight between Talabani and Barzani you know, and so on. But nevertheless, on balance, we use American power to the protection of the Kurdish people. I don't believe in the so-called post-American world, right? Usually the people who speak about the post-American world all live in America. Because if you live somewhere else, you don't believe in the post-American world, you just want to get to America. It's only, <laughs> you know, Yankee go home, but please take me with you. <laughs> so I don't believe in the post-American world. I believe that after the American world, there will come the barbarian world. And I think with all our weaknesses, with all our doubts about empire, with all the doubts of President Obama. I mean, President Obama is an expression of this American mood, isolationism. And you know, it was kind of sweet joke on the people who supported that presidency because they thought Barack Hussein Obama will be cosmopolitan and George W. Bush will be isolationist. And look what happened, an intellectual reversal of the galaxies, right? Bush wanted to do operations of freedom and Obama says, hey, you know, we can't do anything. We know we can't do anything. The American people will decide. And I don't think anything is going to happen in Syria before November. And I don't think that, you know, maybe the American people are tired of these expeditions, but I think it's important. There is a kind of an American leadership. And I think it's kind of when the president says, calls on Bashar to quit, and Bashar doesn't quit, it reminds me now that Robert Caro's book on Lyndon Johnson is out, a new installment of something I love, what Johnson said, where he said, never tell a man to go to hell unless you intend to send him there. 
So we, if we don't intend to send Bashar to hell, please, let's stop telling him to go to hell. Thank you. Uh, Ted, just, you had one more comment? Just, yeah, I'm sorry. There's one thing I'd wanted to say in reply to David Pollack. I think if we look at the history of Kurdistan and Iraq, these were highly trained veteran fighters, really tough mountain people. They couldn't stand up necessarily to tanks and helicopter gunships, but with the U.S. equalizing the fight, they were more than a match for Saddam. Okay, friends, um, uh, two, two closing remarks. First, there is a, a group of uh, very smart people who have been quiet throughout tonight's whole program, and that's the Washington Institute's team of Syria experts. Um, and so after we finish tonight and tomorrow and when you go back to your offices, I hope you will go to your websites and read the work of Andrew Tabler, of Jeffrey White, David Schenker, people at the Washington Institute that have spent years um, focusing on uh, exactly what's going on in Syria, follow this on a day-to-day -day effort, uh, know what's going on with the Syrian military regime and the Syrian military opposition. So to inform yourself, I urge you to read closely the work that they do. Uh, secondly, Stuad, Fuad uh, uh, stole a little bit of what I was going to close with, which is I remember very well the debate last year when the president was considering saying it's time for Assad to go, uh, which was if he says it and Assad doesn't go, don't we look foolish over time? And the decision, and I think it was the right decision, was for the president to say it, for him to be, as he said in a different context, on the right side of history in this case. And the assumption was that it wouldn't be too far in the future before history would catch up with what he said. Now, of course, a great deal of time has now passed. Uh, not decades, but a year is, is more than anyone thought a year ago. And so the three different views that you heard on this panel, engage now, maybe engage later, don't engage. I think were the three views that were debated around the table exactly when the president was deciding the decision then, a year ago, was we can deal with it later. I think these exact same views will be on the table very soon. So thank you all of you, you. for presenting your views tonight. Thank you for being here tonight.